Welcome to this PRCA webinar, which is all about their new report, the PRCA MENA Mental Health Report. So these are some of the words used to describe the PR and communication industry. Exciting, rewarding, even glamorous at times, but also draining and stressful. Um, I don't remember too much glamour when I worked in the profession, but these are the findings uh, that are coming out of the PRCA report. And some of the stats in that say that two in five professionals say that their mental health has got worse during the coronavirus pandemic. And four out of five professionals in the industry say that their bosses are simply not doing enough. Um, so I am delighted today to be joined by people who are far smarter than I to unpack this. Uh, please welcome Dr. Saliha Fridi, who everybody knows is the co-founder of the Lighthouse Arabia, one of the places that is doing such a good job helping us all. John T. Summers, who is the MD of Hanover Communications Middle East. We've got Mimi Nicklin, who is the CEO of Freedom and a best-selling author. And my mental health there is the phone keeps going off. And, uh, and also Leanne Briganza de Silva, uh, who is the Chief Marketing Officer for Cigna Healthcare, who also have their own research. So just to kick it off, um, I'm going to start with the PR professionals in the room. Um, four out of five people saying the bosses in the industry are not doing enough. Jonty, you're a managing director. and I, I know you've been pointed at mental health yourself. So just talk to me about your thoughts about the findings, the figures. Are you surprised that that number is so high? It, it doesn't surprise me at so, it, uh, the, the numbers of those. I was going to say I was actually expecting the numbers to be a bit higher. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, and I don't know whether that's a timing thing or a, who knows, but I mean, it's clearly, it's clearly an issue. And I think there are a number of reasons behind it. I think in public relations, uh, but I, public relations is by no means uh, the, the only industry that this affects. I think it's, I think it's global, universal. I think public relations as a service, a service business, I think has quite a lot of pressure. I think the nature of the region as well, uh, in that, you know, a lot of stuff happens here we're used to moving fast people are used to having stuff now 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 and i think that adds to stress for people and i think you know when you've got you know more generally and and i'm not the best person to comment and i, I know dr saliha and, and mimi and leanne will have views on this but you know when you've got you you've got you know a, a, an industry and a, and a region that is 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 about getting stuff done all the time 24 7 uh, you know, it's going to add to stress to people. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the region as well. I think an uncertainty is, is really difficult, added to the fact that we've all been isolated for a year. And I don't believe that isolation is very good for mental health. I'm definitely not the expert, but that would be my observation. How's that for a start of a five? Well, it's a good start of a five. I, I suppose we should bring in the experts at this stage. And, and Dr. Saliha, um, what's your feeling? I mean, is this something you feel is, is it, it can't be unique to public relations and communications, but um, what's kind of causing this? And also, are you getting, are you seeing outreach from management and bosses that actually recognise that they're not doing a good enough job in this space and need to change? For sure. So there's two things. I think for sure the region in itself has its own unique stressors. We're all away from our families. We all are in the middle of the world. So we serve the East, we serve the West. And so our sleep cycles are off. We're also in a beautiful city, uh, beautiful country that actually is very hustling and bustling. And so it knows no day and it knows no night. And we just sort of kind of go on with that. But our body obviously knows <laughs> day and night. Um, and, and we are not maybe tending to those um, biological, psychological needs that we may have to shut down and to rest. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, but with opportunity comes a lot of movement and a lot of hecticness. And if we are not almost um, Spartan-like in our discipline when it comes to our self-care, if we don't have that level, an Olympian level discipline, we will burn out. Even the fires of passion will burn you out. And so I think this kind of mindset has to be here if you are going to be living and working and creating um, and staying healthy. 
that's one aspect of it. When it comes to the corporate sector, for sure, the outreach from um, government organizations as well as corporate organizations on wanting to tend to people's mental health and well-being has exponentially increased, significantly increased from where we were pre-COVID to where we were post. Now, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden we had more issues. We had issues before COVID, um, but it just was like, well, those are your personal things. And we, we don't tend to personal issues, bring your work self to work. And now when work and home sort of, you know, collapsed into one, companies really are saying, well, there is no differentiation between who is it, you know, what is your work persona and what is your home persona? This is who I am as a human. And so they're finally realizing something that has existed way before, that this is something that they need to tend to and that it's causing, uh, costing them their human sort of potential, their, as their assets are this, this human capital that they are actually losing a lot. And so they, they call it the great attrition because a lot of people are saying, I don't wanna work like this anymore. I don't wanna live like this anymore. And that's global, it's not something in the UAE. So that is something that they're dealing with. How can we retain talent and not have them go off and do their own thing is a big issue for people right now. I mean, it's something we've been reporting at Arabian Business a lot on. Uh, and Mimi, we were talking very recently about this, you know, both on that 24-7 culture, and I know both of you have been writing in uh, our CEO magazine as well, about it's time to actually call time on this 24-7 culture because it's not possible to sustain. Uh, yeah, it absolutely isn't. I mean, uh, you know, as Dr. Salia was saying, our bodies definitely know night and day, even if we don't. Um, and I think, again, Dr. Salia has just was, you know, really setting that scene. Times have changed. There is a realisation. And I think a lot of that is generational as well. And we're going to see that in the PR industry as more and more young people come through. Their expectations and what they're willing to accept is just different. The other thing is this. It's really cool to say that you work 22 hours a day. It's kind of gone right now. It's really cool to actually put your wellness first and go and see a therapist and make sure that you and your family and the people around you are well, are healthy. Because, of course, we went through a pandemic when we couldn't control that. So we had this two years nearly of our lives where we lost control, basically, of everything that we took for granted that we could control. And of course, our health and often our mental health was part of that, because even people that went to see a therapist regularly, had to shift that to online. That was new for many people. It changed our behavior. It wasn't necessarily the same. So people's expectations change. So when you bring together the context that Dr. Saliha was just outlining so beautifully, and then you add in the generational change and just the change of perception around what work life is, what balance is, what working hard means, it no longer means that you're a capitalism machine, right? That is not the definition of success anymore. And that is a fantastic thing for our world because it means we're actually on the cusp of a shift. So I'm gonna, I just wanna bring this back to our audience for a moment. We'll, we'll talk about the macro issues again, but uh, Leanne, what is it about marketing and communications and PR that is actually so stressful? <laughs> Well, you know, for one, just using myself as an example, I think it's um, it's about the deadlines, right? It's about um, you know, working in in a in a corporation. Um, it's about providing that support to either driving growth or uh, you know, bringing together, uh, pushing the brand out. So it's 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 that connection between various departments. So you're always in a situation of of serving. And that in itself means that you're having to meet various deadlines and then equally putting the pressure on your PR agencies or your ad agencies or whatever to meet those deadlines. And, and the one thing that resonated with me that John T and, and Saliha referred to from the employer perspective, um, in our 360 survey, we found that there is a gap between what employees say they provide and what employees are able to access and employees are saying they want more resilience training they want mental health um, uh, access and employees have been relying on these programs to deliver that to their employees but really what employees or people are asking for is um, for their bosses to come out and say that this is important 
right? I mean, it's, it's great to have the programs, but how often are you talking about it in your town halls? How often yeah. are you talking about your senior leadership also accessing the mental health uh, programs that, that you put in place? I mean, John T, I'll, I'll, I'll tag you in here. I mean, uh, there's, there's research in the PRCA report said 44% of respondents, that's nearly half of all respondents, said that over the last year, they had had no communication with their bosses about mental health, which I actually found really, really surprising. Um, that's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, and isn't it? And isn't it just? Um, what the managers and what the, what the bosses need to, to do more in this space, um, and you know, give me some examples of the things you've perhaps been doing at Hanover um to kind of resolve that because that seems absolutely shocking to me that, that that they haven't had this conversation yeah i mean if 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 that's true and i'm assuming it is uh that's that's terrible management terrible leadership i mean one of the one of the things i learned over uh, over the the course of the last year as a as a leader of uh, of you know a, a, a you know a business here is that as a leader it's not really about you it's about yeah. turning up as the best version of yourself for the team so that the team can can do what they need need to do that that that's not always easy because managers guess what have bad days as well i think there's a second part of that and to the point of leanne's point about you know leaders you know acknowledging in town halls i think you know we live in a region that's perhaps not that open to admitting when things aren't going 100 percent. you know it's and and get, enabling a, a a boss to say you know what i've had a hard day and acknowledge that in a in a in a public setting a team setting a town hall setting i think is probably an important first step i know we've certainly in in the hanover business which is obviously global you know we've adopted a you know wide range of measures uh you know we signed up to the 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 global business collaboration for better workplace health and there's a whole load of re things are, are around that and obviously a great toolkit but i've observed in business here not just in the pr industry because uh, i think the pr industry is actually quite my experience is is actually quite good at acknowledging uh acknowledging this i mean a couple of certainly a couple of agencies i know brazen certainly gave everybody sunday off for world mental health day but i think there is a two-tier system i think if you go into i think the big multinationals also do it very well a lot of our clients some of the big firms do amazing things some even with uh with dr saliha's uh business i know um but that's not universal and certainly if you, some of the perhaps some of the smaller businesses more local businesses um that there, there's there's a, a very different way of of doing things that does not involve the acknowledgement that sometimes you might not be having a very good day week month Mimi, i'll bring you in here as well because obviously you've uh, sort of founded and launched freedom as a new creative agency, a purpose-driven agency that, you know, and one of your uh, stated aims is to try and get rid of the burnout and challenge the burnout in the industry. Um, having spent just a couple of years in the industry, how much of this is, is an internal thing and how much of this is the clients and what can you actually do to kind of get a balance between that? Because you're not in control of all of the behaviors even within you know your, your teams face external pressures which are clients who have their own pressures so how do, how do we actually get to a place that do you need to push back against the clients do you need to challenge this behavior um, i mean absolutely and we're terrible at it particularly particularly in this industry i was actually with another agency founder this morning um who's been here i've been here about four years he's been here about 12 and he was like, Mimi, there's no one in this industry that will push back against a client. And I was like, well, that's not my way, right? So the, the reality is in this region, we do not say no. I do, FYI, any of my clients listening. Uh, but we don't say no. There are no barriers and we allow our people to be bulldozed. Let's be totally honest for everyone listening. I'm, I'm sure they're all nodding. We need to stop it, right? There's two ways from, from my point of view that we need to do this. Number one, we need to stand for something as leaders and just say absolutely not and tell them why. For me to fulfill that for you, Mr. Mrs. Client, I need to take away my team's weekend, okay? They've already worked X hours this week. They're tired, they have babies, they have husbands and wives. I can't take away their weekend, right? Why, why should I? So there has to be open dialogue with our clients. I want to help you, but I want to help you in a way that protects all of us, not just some of us, okay? That it's not, it's not 100%, but as a benchmark, I can tell you from experience, it works. You can get to partnerships at work. 
and you can be strong enough to say no. I think the other thing in defense of us as leaders, we are not, and I wish we were, bottomless pockets, okay? So for us to be able to shift into offering our employees what they need, more mental health support, more access, access to therapists or life coaches or education or subscriptions or whatever it is they need we have to shift the norm we cannot continue to work as we have for the last 40 years and just add that all on top and nor should we because the data shows that employees are looking for different things so we have to be brave and that's what I'm trying to do we have to be brave enough to say the way we worked is now different and we are going to reprioritize mental health and wellness and inclusivity of talent. But in order to do that, all of you people that are coming to work, we have to shift other things because I can't just monumentally add, there is capitalism underneath the humanism. And for yeah. me, we have to balance the two. So those two things are fundamental shifts, partnership mindset and being honest, and then shifting our business models. Because without those two things, I think we've got a very, very steep mountain to climb. At this stage, I'm going to invite the audience just to remind them that they can, of course, pose questions to our expert panelists today, just as Roger has just done. Uh, and Saliha, he's actually made a really good point. He's talking about a TED talk, um, but the, his final point is basically we should invite leaders to understand the importance of their own mental health first. And that is one of those things that often it is tough at the top. Uh, and if they can't admit a problem with themselves or they can't be vulnerable or they can't be you know, open to this, then how can they cascade that kind of behavior and conversation down their organizations? What's, what's your thought about, because you've been writing recently for us as well, about the responsibility of leaders in this space? I think there is a generational gap, you know, where we have these Gen Ys that are, you know, they grew up with the mentality that you just uh, stiff upper lip and you just buck up and show up. And this is just how some of us have been raised and that's just the culture we've been around. I put myself in that category, but this was just the culture and we live in the Middle East. There's a lot of taboo around this. There's a lot of stigma around this. You don't show your vulnerability at work. You show up to work and you get things done. And that's the mentality. Now, what's happening is that the leadership is not necessarily shifting their mindset. It's the people that are the millennials, the Gen Zs that are showing up into the workforce that are really destabilizing and shaking up this kind of way of thinking of things. So it might not be coming from top down, but I have seen it happen top down as well. And it's been very inspiring to see where people say that, listen, this is where I struggle. This is how I coped with it. This is me going to see a therapist. Like I've seen that and it's wowed people. Um, and one comment actually just reverberated for months and months where a leader just said, I see a therapist. And it like shook up the whole company um, culture. Um, in that one comment. But like I said, the movement will probably come bottom up and it will be forced because like I said, they will not be able to retain talent. They will not be able to sustain this kind of way of living and working. It's just not, it's the, the, sh the shifting is happening and it's, it's happening at a very rapid pace. This is interesting because there seems to be, there is an increasing body of research uh, and evidence, and we've had report after report recently. Um, Leanne, I'm going to bring you in here in a moment. Um, within the PRCA uh, research, it shows that it's the younger staff, it's the millennials, it's the Gen Zs who actually speak out and are, are more willing to speak out. And the PRCA is actually going, yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean they've got the most problems. It's just they're the most willing to talk about it. And in fact, it's the, it's the, it's the Gen Xers and the boomers. I'm not a boomer, I'm Gen X. Uh, that actually are hiding these problems. Uh, and you, at Cigna, did your own research as well. So what, what's your view on that? And as a, as a leader yourself, how do you have that conversation with yourself before you have that conversation with teams? Yes, and, and it's an interesting uh, point that... Uh, Saliha brought out and, and you did as well, Scott. I mean, we, we call that generation the sandwich generation, right? Um, we're finding that the sandwich generation is actually the one that is the most stressed out. They're the ones having to either look after their aging parents and manage their kids. And so they're caught in between trying to manage both those responsibilities along with work. And like Mimi not rightly said, they've been, you know, we've been brought up to do that. And I find myself in that situation oftentimes last year for me was a terrible year. 
um, you know, my mom was ill and I actually found that that research had different meaning for it for me when, when we were talking about it. I'm part of that sandwich generation. And I had to take a step back and I had to tell colleagues and my team that, you know what, I need time off because my mom's not well and I'm overwhelmed. And it was catalyzed by the research that we did and us wanting to do something more for the community. So as part of me living and breathing what I'm trying to do, I ended up starting to be more aware about you know, that balance that is required. Um, and in a way it prepared me for what my team was going through when, when they went through similar stuff. Sometimes just, you know, when you have a one-to-one, -one, when you're supposed to talk about work, we just end up talking about, you know, our parents and, you know, our kids and the challenges of managing the work-life balance. And I, I will openly admit that I, I'm not able to do it all all the time. And it felt very different, sometimes uncomfortable doing that. But, you know, I think having been through it myself, um, I realized that it, I needed to to step in and step into the office as a very different person than I would have maybe, you know, two years ago. Mimi, um, Celia was also talking about, you know, talent retention. Um, and we are going into, we're seeing the great resignation, we're seeing the great attrition. In this region, we've definitely got a scarcity of talent, I think, at this moment. So how much should this all be a wake-up call for organisations that, you know, actually, if you want to protect your bottom line, if you want to protect your performance, if you want to keep your clients and be able to service them, you're going to have to change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, could there be a louder one? Right? Could there be a louder wake-up call than this? The, the data is plentiful and organisations like PRCA are, are a huge part of making, you know, of raising awareness of that by, by providing annual data that keeps reminding leaders, you cannot ignore it. We are talking about human beings. We are fallible, right? We, we are organic beings. You, you just can't keep going like this. And I think we're seeing, you know, the evidence all around the place. We know that by 2030, I am pretty sure this is accurate, by 2030, the greatest cost to life will be mental health issues, okay? Yeah. It's costing the United States already $5 trillion a year $5 trillion a year in um, lost productivity, mental health, right? So however you cut this pie, right, by 2030 or now, people are dying and our businesses are failing. What other wake up call, Scott, is there? We have to change. There is no two ways about it. And as someone who is, I believe and I hope, really creating shift in the way we're trying to do business, I can confirm 100% it's really really difficult okay really difficult to start again to reframe an industry to change everything from structures to payment to benefits to rewards in order to do this because what we're talking about is monumental it is difficult but when in life was anything worthwhile ever easy and that would be my cry to our industry and to all the people in it and to all the young people listening you have the power to create change it's not a simple one but you have people around you organizations around you who are supporting the need for that whether as I said whether it's the economics of it and the, the impact on our economy or the impact on human life this is a wake-up call and it's a, it's a time of immense change it has to be. John D I can see you nodding your head there I mean I see this uh, sort of talent war uh, from a different side of the fence to you at the minute because right now we've got the PR and the communication industry hoovering up journalists and I can't hire anyone for my industry which what that says about my industry um, is probably even more challenged than, than your industry um, but how do you stay on top of that how do you look after your staff to make sure that you were, you are retaining that talent because the work's getting busier isn't it I mean we're seeing re almost revenge work the economy snapped back Q3, Q4 there's so much activity there your, your guys are going to be stretched. I mean, I'm not talking just about Hanover. I'm just, I'm talking about your industry. Well, I think that's true. I mean, there's always, there's, there is a war, there's a war for talent all over the place. And I don't think it's, and I think we live in a region which, which obviously draws lots of people to it, but you know, you, you, it's sometimes hard to find, particularly if you're looking for specialist talent, uh, people with special skills, it's hard, it's hard to find them. And so I have great sympathy for you, Scott. Uh, I, I have, I share some of your challenges. You really shouldn't. I mean, I, 
we know that one of the greatest stresses for people in the PR industry is talking to grumpy journalists like me when you're trying to pitch things. And 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 you know, well, and vice versa. Probably, you know, you know, you are our you are our target, but also our frustrations. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, I guess back, to, you know, back to the back to the question: How do you how do you retain talent? Well, I think I think a lot of it, a lot of it, as in all things, comes down to comes down to giving people work that has meaning to them, uh, for them, uh, that they enjoy doing in an environment that they enjoy being and and that nurtures them. Um, you know, we made the we made yeah. Uh, I, this is not necessarily about a, a quest for happiness, but there but, but there's definitely a there, there are definitely differences between kind of hedonic happiness, you know, pleasure and enjoyment, uh, and the sort of happiness that is gained for from uh, dealing with work that brings meaning and purpose to your life. And I think you know the problem with hedonism it's amazing, but it's never really enough. So I think that's one of the challenges we saw last year that people were, you know. Take, their sources of pleasure were taken away and they were they only had the things that were internal to them so i think you know if you're if you're forced to rely on internal resources uh you know it, that, that can be hard and i guess as part of a long-term focus for finding meaning in, in life more generally uh you know a, a, a good life uh if you can find a meaning it's going to help you it's going to help you endure uh, and deal with the, the suffering that you're at some point something's going to happen to you you've got to you're going to have to deal with something difficult so you know i think i think what the last 18 months has provided to everybody is is an opportunity to reflect on what what is meaningful in your life you know what are your values how do you gain a sense of accomplishment rather than necessarily uh, a, achievement um big challenge for bosses you know how can you make how can you make uh, this pr program uh, you know, a source of real meaning. It's not, it's uh, Dr. Salia, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring Dr. Salia in here. I can see, I can see you nodding. Um, I mean, happiness versus purpose, maybe that, you know, they're the same thing, but we hear a lot about purpose these days. How can organizations create purpose for their employees and help them achieve that purpose? Um, and, and how have you seen that conversation grow and change? No, it's it's a little bit of a tricky question um, because organizations can't create purpose. Purpose comes from the inside and organizations need to hire and inspire people that are aligned with their mission and their purpose. So I think this really and I think the whole conversation is I'm just going to shift it a little bit because there's a lot of responsibility being placed on the employer here and maybe not so much on the employee itself and there needs to be there needs to be a shift in personal authority and personal responsibility. There needs to be people that say, wait a minute, how am I feeling right now? I feel quite disconnected to myself. What is my purpose? It's not my job as an employer to inspire you. It's also your job to actually be connected to your spirit, which can then be inspired. So what are you doing in order to take care of your health? Because I can provide you, as Leanne said, I can provide you all sorts of resources but what are you doing to do something about your mental health how are you safeguarding your sleep are you drinking too much caffeine at 6 p.m at night which is going to disrupt your sleep cycle the employer can't be there babysitting the person all the time so oh, <laughs> scott put it down put it down scott you know like <laughs> we're all on it <laughs> this is, I mean, for me, it's really because it's, it, there's a language here that is actually making it seem like we're all victims here and like the employer will set you free and the freedom lays in the hand of the employer. It's not so. You have to take a lot of personal authority and personal responsibility as we move into a future where we might even be working from home forever, you know, like there are some companies who've just shut down their offices and now you're supposed to work from home, like who's, who's managing you then? And I think that's where a lot of self-management is coming in and people are, they're, you know, Netflixing and social mediaing, and then they're wondering why the workload is so much like 
it doesn't work. It has to be fully two people committed. The company needs to be committed to the well being, but the employee needs to be committed to their own well being. And I don't see that happening. I feel a lot of people went from childhood where the authority was with the parent, then to college where the authority was with the institution. And then they came into job where the authority is now into the corporate. It's like, when are you going to grow up? and say, this is my health, and there ain't no one gonna try to save me except myself. So that's me just giving my two cents on people owning it, own it. I, I, I feel like you're talking direct to me now as well, and I'm, I'm sorry to forget that. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it. But it, but it's, what's, what's fascinating in that PRCA uh, research as well is it they actually said like, look, 36% of people faced a mental health problem, but didn't talk to anybody about it at work, yep. then almost the majority, nearly four out of every five that did talk about it, said that they had a positive experience and that it actually helped them. So uh, Leanne, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you, like you were nodding a lot and obviously agreeing with a lot of what Celia has said there, you know, personal responsibility as well as employer responsibility. Yes, absolutely. And um, once the employer puts these programs in place, um, one is you actually going out and using the program, right? So most employers have EAP, EAP programs, employee assistance programs, and those employee assistance programs, I mean, from our utilizations, we're finding that the top 10, um, you know, areas that employees use them for are one trying to figure out how to manage their kids' stress level. You know, my daughter has exams and she's overwhelmed. How do I work with that? Or their anxiety levels around work-life balance or dealing with, you know, issues with colleagues or politics at work. So clearly you can see some, some, some trends here, but those are people who are helping themselves. And the ones that help themselves are able to find frameworks with the support provided by employers to manage. Um, and this brings to mind an interesting uh, quote I read in a poem, in, in a book that's a stress book about poems, actually. Don't ask me why I have it. So it says, it's there to remind you that among your duties, pleasure is a thing that also needs accomplishing. That time and light are kinds of love. And love is no less practical than a coffee grinder. That was by Tony Hoagland. What a beautiful way to remind us that we have to make time for ourselves, right? As much as we take time to make coffee, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to put aside that time. So if you've got the programs, use them, right? Because they're Am I book you for poetry you. reading in our office, Leanne, please? I think, I think it could be a <laughs> weekly thing, an open mic poetry session. That would be amazing. <laughs> well, I'm supposed to be a writer, but I actually want to ask Mimi about this as well, because you are a best-selling author, indeed, about empathy. Does that empathy have to extend to ourselves? Do we have to be a little bit easier on us, or do we have to have more understanding of ourselves? So then we can then walk into the, the workplace and go, no, this is what I need. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I speak a lot about self-empathy, which, of course, is Dr. Salihas, uh, you know, part of her sort of academic specialism, but from a principal point of view, Absolutely. You know, we, you know, everyone said it on the school, you need to make time for yourself. And as the business world shifts, and we were saying, you know, maybe we're going to move to remote forever. But definitely, we are seeing many more small organizations, whether they're solopreneurs or small startups or whatever. And again, leading one, that changes everything because you can't always have a, an employee support program, Leanne, I hope I got the acronym right, um, because the big guys can, right? The big companies can, but the smaller ones can't. So we have to understand ourselves. And it's exactly what Dr. Celia was saying. You have to know what you need. If you are not aware of you, how can you possibly help anyone else, right? It goes back to that age old, put, other, put your oxygen mask on before you put anyone else's on in the plane, right? You have to look after you first, and particularly with empathy, which the world needs more of, if you are not clear on who you are, what you need, what you need to thrive, how are you ever going to connect with anyone else without risking your perception clouding their reality? Because you think you know what they need, but actually it's so clouded by what you need. And however much support and access you have, you need to go into that with your eyes open. You may not know the solve, you may not know what you need because you have specialists to help you, but you have to take that step. And I think we've talked today about being brave and about being vulnerable um, and working out how you do that as a, as a leader in the workplace. And, and you know, right at the beginning, John was talking about it. How do you say to your team, I'm just not well enough today to help you, I'm afraid. You know, I need, I need a 
more probably not a day off a month off or something right to help because you know, again like one day isn't going to fix an, anything like I love that we have these awareness days they're so important because we have discussions and, and they pull people together but this is not you can't take a day off and make it better right this I mean is John yeah <laughs> I mean, that, that is interesting. I mean, and a lot of these issues, when we have these banner days, these banner days are important, obviously, to raise awareness. But it, it can't be a single day. It can't be a hallmark event. It's got to be a 365. You know, this, they've got to be built into the culture all the time. Uh, John T, I want to ask you a challenging question. Can you, as a PR agency, you know, or, or as a PR industry, the communication industry, actually do what Mimi was talking about earlier uh, and actually challenge your industry to change? Because... Um, you've got so many, you know, you've got competing players in there. We're all after clients' business. Um, how do you stand calm, almost like united and go, no, actually, we're, we're not going to work this way anymore because this will continue. You know, you might draw a line in the sand, but a competitor will then continue purely because they need the, they, they want to win the business. How do you change as an industry? Well, I think... <laughs> Yeah, so you, you're right. There's obviously there will always be someone who will who will try to do it when you say you can't do it, and and you know maybe that you have to be fine with that if they want if that's what they want to do, to do. I think there's quite a lot of alignment within the uh, within the public relations industry in this region. I think we're actually we're actually quite a tight knit group. I think people agency heads talk to each other. I think there's quite a lot of there's 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 quite there's quite a lot of collaboration. Obviously see we do compete and I, th I think there's probably there is probably a there are probably some principles that the industry could come up with on around around health and well-being which would arguably be a, a good thing to do and I know there are there are you know globally there are other principles I mean I mentioned we, we've signed up for the first for, for, for the global principles um, yeah uh, but yeah you I, I think I think arguably the int the industry should obviously if there are if there are people who are going to come and undercut you and and want to operate like that the, the reality was stress as well the other thing is that and i say this to my team you know there are there are things you can control and things you can't control and you can't worry about things that you can't control and one of the if you know one of the things i did take away from last year i start i started read, reading quite a lot of uh, stoic philosophy and if, if ever you want a resource i think the daily stoic is a pretty good read and it does it does get you quite grounded in stuff that you can control the life is hard sometimes there will be suffering but actually focus on what you can control and 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 influ you you have influence over what you have power to influence and then you just have to accept everything else for what it is sometimes it's good sometimes it's absolutely terrible sometimes it's a global pandemic Celia, uh, I had a previous employer say to me that anxiety is good in a newsroom. Stress is good in a newsroom. Um, what's the research on this? Is anxiety in any shape good for you? Yeah, sure. I think small bouts of anxiety, meaning the stress response. When we say anxiety, we're talking about the fight or flight stress response in the body. When I'm running on the treadmill, it is a stress response in my body because my mind doesn't know if I'm running from a lion or if I'm running on a treadmill. So you're actually activating a lot of the same adrenaline, et cetera, into, into your body. Now, if I am living in a chronic state of stress, that's mm -hmm. when the bodies, because what happens when you are in a stress response is that the long-term projects shut down and all the energy is sent to the limbs, to the liver, it, it trans, um, uh, translates the liver gl glucose into energy. And all of a sudden you have energy to run from whichever thing that it is that you're running from. Now that's okay for 30 minutes, you know, an hour, when you're in the newsroom, when you're doing a presentation, you show up and you've got all of that pumping and, you know, and you feel like you showed up fully, but now you live like that in a, even in a mild to moderate state of a fight or flight, which is what re research is showing that most of us are living in a state of fight or flight on some level a as a chronic state. That's when illness comes in because your, your GI system shuts down, your fertility system shut down, all of your long-term projects in your body, like your growth hormone is not kicking on at that time. Your immunity, you don't need immunity when you are about to be eaten by a lion so this stuff shuts down yeah. 
And so we don't want long-term sustained, but for sure, when, when you're in the newsroom and all of a sudden you have that energy pumping through you, that's okay. But now can you soothe yourself down and get to bed and have a deep restorative sleep? That's what most people are not doing. Once they're done with the newsroom, then they're like, oh my God, I messed up. I said this. I shouldn't have said this. I can't believe I did that. Then they go out drinking. Then they go out smoke. I don't know what they do afterwards. And then they don't sleep. And then, and that's where the, the stress is prolonged and sustained. And then it becomes chronic. I, I must have had a stressful life. I think my hair, oh, hair growth hormone obviously shut down some significant time ago. <laughs> Um, Leanne, yeah. uh, Signa, you had your research out and it was interesting. I mean, if we look through the different pieces of research, the PRCA come out with this excellent research about the PR industry. Signa, uh, you had your 360 wellness report, which also showed, you know, 88% of the UEE stressed, one of the highest levels of stress in the world. We then had that followed by Bupa that was then also saying, you know, 96% of high net worth individuals are sowing at least one stressor. So when the super rich is stressed, you know, it's tough at the top, it's tough at the bottom and it's tough in the middle. Um, how important is it, though, that we're actually, I mean, you know, Celia was also saying before we came on, that we're actually having this conversation now. And it's, you know, Celia was busier than ever on World Mental Health Day. And I'm sure almost all of you were aware and doing things around World Mental Health Day. It, at least it's on people's radars now. We're more aware of this than ever before. Yeah, I, I think what this does is it, besides creating the awareness, we hope it creates the the action, right? And before we went live on the webinar, I was just telling Dr. Saliha that we had her team come in and do two sessions as a result of just these kind of conversations. The first session was we, um, Lighthouse Arabia came in and trained uh, a group of people in our office to be mental health first aid responders. And I didn't really understand how important that was because what those those people do is if there's anybody who's you know having a hard time they can approach any one of these responders to at least talk to them they assess them and then they you know can decide whether or not action needs to be taken the second piece of action we took was we had a mental health a champions course done with our executive committee and that level of awareness was actually needed even more than the mental health first aid responders because we know that some of our teams may be going through a tough time but we need to realize that we have to encourage them to to talk about it and also as leaders show some level of vulnerability to be able to invite that conversation but then also be aware of what this means for us um, so i think you know it is creating change it is causing uh, employees hopefully to to take some steps and these steps albeit small are hopefully going to you know start to have some ripple effects um, in in companies and organizations. Mimi are you seeing this take place I mean is, is there any change happening with the, um, almost within the client side because we talk about the generational change we've got the you know we've got the Gen Z's and the millennials who are having this conversation but we've also got ESG rising in the world and part of that is governance. Um, and toxic workplaces and toxic organizations are increasingly being called out. So do you see any hope that actually the corporate world, the people on the client side recognize that they need to change because they simply can't get away with it anymore? Well, you know me, I always have hope, right? I am like Miss Hope over here. I have hope for everything in the world at any given day. Um, so yes, there is hope. I have hope. I think we all should have hope because there is, as everyone said, there is change. There is shift. I mean, there's organizations training mental health first aiders. There's all kinds of things going on. But the reality is it's slow, you know, and, and, and really for every really great hope, if you're honest, there's another story that's not so great. Um, because we're at the beginning of this journey, we shouldn't be in 2021. We should have realized before, maybe it took a global pandemic uh, to, to level that playing field. Um, I think there's enough movement to create that shift. I think there's enough proof that the change is happening and that there is a recognition that human beings um, need to be human beings. First and foremost, that we do need to understand that we're people before, the, you know, before we're employees. 
certainly in my work, um, you know, I have all kinds of amazing brands ask me to, to come and talk to them about empathy and communication in the workforce and why we need to understand each other. There's huge shifts in DNI, which sort of feels like a separate discussion, except it's not. Because if we don't integrate as human beings, we're never going to balance our mental health and wellness, right? We're not meant to be alone. We're just not. Human beings are not alone beings. We, we're pack animals, right? We thrive when we're together. So the more we can do to bring us back together, to bring that empathy, that understanding together, to open those lines of communication and see each other as human beings, the more that ripple effect will have on our health and well-being, because that's where we came from. Um, you know, as animals, really. Um, so yeah, I am full of hope. I always am. There's definitely key people out there making a shift and standing up for change. Some of them are like 15 years old, right? It's not just the leaders. Um, but we need to do more of this. We need to keep talking as leaders. We need to find time to come to these webinars, to talk to people, to spread the message, because the only way we're going to create shift is to keep banging the drum. John T, your surname suggests you're a ray of sunshine. Um, what's yeah, giving, relentlessly upbeat. <laughs> what give, giving you hope? What What's the chink of light that you're seeing in the industry? Well, I I, I think that there's I think that there's a recognition that that you know that good men, good mental health cannot be taken for granted. Um, I I think you know I think it, there, there's a recognition in the industry that it needs to be protected, it needs to be nurtured, that, that, that people need to have an ongoing process of self care and self awareness and 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 self support. Um, and I think you know we're in a we're in a and I and I think as well I'm seeing changes in that uh, you know Leanne's industry uh, you know healthcare provide you know healthcare is now a part of health insurance, which let's face it has not always been the case but i think most most policies although not un, not universally and not at all levels cover cover mental well-being as part of the, uh, the health cover that employ employers provide um so i'm 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 also i'm also positive uh, to be honest i don't think we have a choice because otherwise i think you you risk having a society that that breaks and yeah. that'll be no fun at all Leanne, you're nodding there as well. Um, so I'm going to ask you for your, your, your glimmers of hope for us. Well, as, as Mimi was saying, I mean, I, I really like, um, you know, what, what you referenced, which was, you know, having that, that empathy piece of it. Um, besides the programs that we have, um, I think we've, we've got to, as leaders, start to put ourselves out there a lot more and um, start to bring more of our vulnerable side to work. Um, and I think, you know, the more we keep doing that, the more we, we kind of push away the stigma that, that the research is saying that people don't want to talk about, you know, yeah. the overwhelmingness that they face or the fact that women think that it's something that's too personal to, to bring to work. I mean, I, I hope with people like Dr. Saliha, Mimi, myself, that as we start talking about the fact that we don't have it all, um, the fact that we have terrible vulnerable days um the people will, will feel more courageous to come out and talk to their bosses or or talk to each other and and more than anything taking on from the empathy side i think we need to start having more and more check-ins with each other just not about work but just generally about how you're doing right let's let's start that again um, so that we can keep people um you know on point in this conversation going Dr. Saliha, I'm going to give the mic drop moment to you to close off this webinar. Uh, with a question as well, though, how we, we read headlines such as the Great Reset. How important is it for us to actually take this opportunity and not to try and reset to a default that wasn't really fit for purpose even before we got to this point? So interesting that you asked this question because I was actually thinking that, that I think we've come to a place, a point of no return. This is no longer, there's no going back to anything. There's no like, it, we're, we're too far from it now. We can't go back. Um, and, and I think this is where there is a lot of anxiety that I'm sensing in people. There's a lot of hopelessness that I'm sensing in a lot of people. This is what we're seeing, that people actually don't know where else to go at this point, because they can't go back. 
but they don't know how to move forward. And they're kind of in this middle passage here where there's no roadmap as to how to move forward. So it can create a lot of anxiety. And this is where I think people need to tap into the, the part of them that has been resilient we've existed on this planet for thousands of years without gps or technology or laptops and we did it because we belonged to ourselves and we belonged to each other we were connected to ourselves we moved with nature we moved with the sun we ate with the sun you know we sat with the sun this is i mean this is very intuitive living and if we sort of go into that part of ourselves, we will know our way forward. But if we keep looking at some Google website or WebMD, we might lose our way. It's not going to be there. It's not outside of us that we need to seek. It is actually everything we need is inside of us. And that is the part of us that has been resilient for thousands of years on this planet. And I think if we tap into that part, we will know our way forward. Everybody nodding at that point. Some final words, and also we'll see if any more questions come before we close. I mean, we could talk about this for literally hours, but uh, I'll go around the room one last time. Um, Leanne, any closing statement? Well, just that, you know, one, make sure that you, if you have programs in place, that you're actually using them. But then more than anything else, make time for yourself. Switch your phone off at night. Don't. Let it be the first thing you look at in the morning and, you know, and make time to, to check in with at least two people a week to find out how they're doing. John T, your secrets of your success? <laughs> well, well, uh, I don't know about success, but I do think I do think looking looking in looking to yourself and making a commitment to being more mindful, uh, you know, if you need to sort yourself out first. Uh, before you can really sort other people out, I think. And, and when I look at some of the things I've done for myself, or f literally for myself over the last year, they have all helped alleviate stress, make me more centred and, and arguably a better person, which I think is good. Mimi, are you a better person these days? Oh God, who knows? <laughs> Absolutely, who knows? Um, but I would say, I guess my last thought is that um, human beings, we're not great fans of change. We, we don't love change, you know, we, we're creatures of habit so often, but only with change is going to come betterment, right? We have to change all kinds of things. Our businesses, our structures, our, the way we pay people, the way we look after people, the hours we work, we have to be open to change. And as I said earlier, you know, nothing fundamentally amazing came from a comfort zone. So put yourself out there as a leader or as a person and embrace change because we have to make each other better. Our society quite literally depends on it. Um, I think that's um, almost all the time we have. Um, and before we go, on behalf of journalism as an editor in chief to the PR agency in the communications industry, can I just apologize for us all being so grumpy? Uh, honestly, <laughs> our, our cultures are worse than your cultures. So just bear, just bear with us. Um, we'll try and get better. Uh, but I uh, know, I mean, um, amazing research. Um, it's great to have read, you know, in Arabian business, we're super keen on this. PRCA, great work with the with the research. Signa also, thank you for that. Keep talking, keep the you know, keep banging the drum, keep turning the volume up. This uh, and for everybody out there, just keep looking after yourself. And thank you for joining and joining us on this session, Dr. Saliha, Leanne, John T, Mimi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye, everyone.